So uh, she is probably most well known for discovering uh, pulsars. But since doing that, she has had a huge impact in Europe on STEM and being a pioneering woman herself in STEM, helping other women to become pioneering people in STEM. So that was one thing that I really enjoyed. Uh, the discovery of the pulsar is something that she'll be covering today. And she's had a huge impact in the field of astrophysics because of her many different uh, skills and her ability to sort of rally people into important projects, such as organizing women into the STEM fields. So as I promised, I'm going to keep this uh, introduction very short and allow now uh, Professor Bell Burnell, who's one of the top most influential physicists and the top female physicist uh, of the last 10 years, according to one ranking. So I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Bell Burnell and let's give her a warm welcome to the physics department at Wake Forest University. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jed, for that kind introduction. So am I heard okay? We can hear you loud and clear. Brilliant, good, okay. So I'm going to talk about pulsars briefly, the discovery of pulsars and things that have kind of spun out from the discovery of pulsars, the consequences or the impact. And I can't move my PowerPoint on, that's interesting. Ar, har, har, har. Oh, yep, right, okay. So, Pulsars were discovered through radio astronomy. And radio astronomy itself is a relatively new field, at least compared with optical astronomy. It started post World War II. Um, I may be biased being British, but one of the most famous radio telescopes is in Britain at Jodrell Bank in the north of England. And this rather lovely photograph of it shows it and a setting sun. The radio telescope has recently been given world heritage status, which is a good headache for the university because it means it's got to be kept standing, if not working, functional. But it is a very magnificent machine, I must admit. So post-World War II, people who had been working in radar during the World War acquired by various means some radar receiving equipment and removed that back to their home university. It was already known, at least in the Western world, that the sun was a radio source, at least some of the time. It is said that the Japanese never worked out what this thing was that was jamming their radar that was low in the east in the morning, high in the south in the middle of the day, and low in the west in the evening. It was the sun. <laughs> Having brought this equipment back to their universities and got it working, radio astronomers confirmed that the sun was a radio source, but found a lot of really relatively strong objects up there in the sky that emitted radio waves. They were working at some megahertz at that stage. I would say between 10 and 100 megahertz at a guess. They managed to position some of these objects at least roughly and turned to their optical colleagues and said, what is there at such and such a position? And the optical astronomers would say, well, there's something that looks a bit like a star, but it doesn't look like an ordinary star. And these things became known as quasi-stellar radio sources, or quasars for short. And the quasar name has stuck. It's now an official name. Now, two of the people who were working on the optical data from these objects were in Caltech. There was Martin Schmidt and Jesse Greenstein. And they could not make sense of the optical spectra they were getting. Jesse Greenstein was in the process of writing a paper explaining why these objects were very rich in tellurium, 
because tellurium was the only thing he could get to explain the spectrum. Martin Schmidt, meanwhile, along the hallway, was working on the spectrum from another quasar and judged it looked very like the spectrum of hydrogen, except the whole lot was shifted to the red end of the spectrum. He began to wonder if it was actually hydrogen with a very large redshift and went along the corridor to Jesse Greenstein and his so-called tellurium spectrum and said, Jesse, could it be a hydrogen spectrum with a large redshift? And Jesse tried it and agreed that it was. Now, it was known back then that the universe was expanding. And so things at some distance from us had a redshift. Furthermore, the redshift increased with time. Sorry, that's not the best way to put it. Um, the redshift was caused by an expanding universe. And in the early days of the expanding universe, the expansion was fast and maybe was slower now. So they expected larger redshifts to mean further back in time, nearer the Big Bang, nearer the start of the universe. And the alarming things about the redshifts these two objects needed were they were large, which meant if this redshift red shift hypothesis was right, because the redshift was large, these things were very far away. So they should be dim, but they were bright. And they were forced to conclude ultimately that actually they were seeing extremely bright objects at large distances. And therefore they were seeing them as they were when the light set off from those distant objects. They were seeing them some time ago when the expansion was quite large. They find this a bit hard to stomach. It is said that Martin Schmidt went home that evening and said to his wife, something terrible happened in the office today. And he was talking about the discovery of these large redshifts and the consequences. The objects became known as quasars, which is short for quasi-stellar radio source, and quasar has stuck. Slight digression here to talk about my history. I've got a funny accent, even by British, you will probably judge. I started life in the north of Ireland. I had my latter schooling years in the north of England, in York. And I went and did my first degree, my bachelor's degree in Glasgow in Scotland. I had decided before I left school, I wanted to be a radio astronomer and I was looking to do a PhD in radio astronomy. Jodrell Bank didn't seem very interested in me. I didn't think I'd get into Cambridge, far too prestigious. So I was probably heading to Australia but the academic year in Australia begins several months later. I had a few months in hand. I put in an application to Cambridge just in case and very much to my surprise, got a place. When I turned up in Cambridge, I was totally overawed. Everybody seemed very clever, very at ease in Cambridge, absolutely sure of their right to be there. And I felt a bit like some sort of country bumpkin uh, from the north and west of the country. As you can perhaps see on my maps, the, the north and west of the country is rather more mountainous and poorer than the south and east. And I'd gone from this mountainous rough area to this very suave southeast. I felt there was a cultural gradient in the country. <laughs> Now, of course, you wouldn't have anything like this in the USA, would you? <laughs> or it wouldn't be as simple, would it? <laughs> so I was really overawed when I turned up there. I now recognize I suffered from imposter syndrome. Is that a phrase you're familiar with? We have definitely heard that before, yes. Right. Maybe. 
we didn't talk about it in Britain, we didn't name it, we didn't recognize it. But with hindsight, I can see I was. I felt that everyone in Cambridge was very clever and I wasn't. So they'd made a mistake admitting me. They were going to discover their mistake and they'd throw me out. I now work in Oxford and again, Oxford is prestigious and we have to look out for students who suffer imposter syndrome because if we're not on the case very quickly the student has taken themselves off home quit within a week of the start of term of the start of the year well i'd had quite a battle to get where i got and i wasn't going to walk out of my own accord but i did know i was sure they were going to throw me out at some point and i adopted a strategy of working my very hardest so that when they threw me out, I wouldn't feel guilty. I'd know I'd done the best I could. I'd made the most of the opportunity and I just wasn't clever enough. My discomfort grew slightly in the first week when new radio astronomy graduate students, well, not all of them, there were one or two peculiar guys called theoreticians, but the rest of us each got presented with a set of tools. And this is my set of tools. I still have them. These are not delicate microelectronics tools. These are heavy duty wire working tools because I was going to do quite a lot of heavy duty wire working. The project I was attached to was to find more quasars. At that point, there were only about 20 quasars known in total, and that wasn't really enough. The project was to find more. And they exhibited a phenomenon called interplanetary scintillation, a sort of twinkling. There's an optical analogy you may have been told that if you look at the night sky, stars twinkle and planets don't because planets have a larger angular diameter. In radio astronomy, quasars twinkle and other radio sources don't because quasars have a much smaller angular diameter. The twinkling is quite short time scale um, so I observed with a time constant of a tenth of a second, which is really ridiculously short in radio astronomy. And I observed for six months and I found about 180 more quasars. So the number went up from 20 to 200, which is very respectable. And it was a useful database. The twinkling in radio astronomy is caused by the solar wind. There's an ionized gas blows off, lifts off from the sun and moves out between the planets. And it's not perfectly uniform. There are some patches with enhanced electron density and some patches with lower electron density. <clears throat> and we're viewing radio, distant radio sources through this cloudy, patchy medium, ionized medium. And the top diagram, uh, which can't, can't be to scale for obvious reasons, shows a very distant quasar, which is actually a way through the ceiling of your room. It's uh, far, far away. And the signal from the quasar comes down and it has to reach the radio telescope on the ground, passing through this cloudy wind. And sometimes the beam is going through a cloud and sometimes it's going through a gap between the clouds. And so what you see from a compact object is fluctuations in the intensity as shown in the bottom part of the diagram. There's a time scale on that one second time bar. The fluctuations are quite rapid. Now, the other kind of radio emitting object that was known at the time in the sky was a radio galaxy. And they were relatively much more extended. And so you would typically view them, excuse me, 
not just through a cloud, but through a cloud and some of the gaps as well. And so the clouds blowing, go, the clouds blowing past didn't produce the same fluctuations. The relatively extended sources gave a much steadier signal. So we can pick out quasars because their signal fluctuates very rapidly if we use a short enough time constant. The snag about using a short time constant is it makes the signal to noise ratio worse. A longer integration time would improve the signal to noise, but we'd lose this technique for picking out the quasars. So to improve the signal to noise again, you build an enormous radio telescope with a huge collecting area and boost the signal. So my first job was to help build this radio telescope. This slide shows typical working conditions. Uh, I'm the person in front of the little red and white hut, all huddled up against the cold and the wet, because we're working in the field. Uh, Don, my technician, is standing by some very expensive cable that we could not coil up and take indoors. And I've been putting plugs and sockets on the ends of the cable and we're testing the impedance to make sure the connections are good. I have a slotted waveguide in front of me. Working in the field is not only cold and wet, it, it's quite difficult. Um, you have several hundred yards of mains cable to get electricity out there. And if you try using a soldering iron in the wind, the soldering iron is not hot enough because of the wind cooling to melt the solder. So it's difficult. The telescope we were building covered an area of several acres. That's 57 tennis courts. It was relatively cheap. We don't say this too loudly in the presence of research funders, but it was relatively cheap. That money would have bought starter homes for three or four newly married couples at that time. And there were six of us who worked for two years to build this radio telescope. And my role was all the cables, the connectors, the transformers, the plugs, the sockets. This is the finished article. It looks homemade. It is homemade. It consists of over 2,000 half-wave dipoles. They're made of copper wire, and you can perhaps recognize the copper by the bluey-green color, oxidized copper. What's much more obvious are lots of wooden posts. They are to keep everything out of the tall, wet grass. Wet grass is a good electrical short. You have to keep all your copper wiring well above the wet grass. Um, the telescope, although it's physically built as one unit, is electrically two halves. So it's an interferometer with the two halves adjacent. Um, you could also electrically phase it to swing it in what you might call altitude, what we'd call declination. And you scan in the other direction by the rotation of the Earth. Uh, the receivers were made of, sorry, not valves, vacuum tubes. I had used transistors as an undergraduate and queried why they weren't using transistors. Whoa, noisy things. Whoa, unreliable things. They did ultimately change to transistors, but not for a long time. <laughs> so that took two rows to build, two years to build. And then when it was completed, the other five people melted away to other jobs. And I was left to debug the telescope, get it working and use it. I was by this stage within one year of the end of my funding. So it was clearly going to be a busy year. At that time, the University of Cambridge had one computer. It had memory comparable to a laptop today and it took up a whole whole room because it was made with vacuum tubes not transistors 
transistors were still very, very new. And very few people could have time on this little computer. And my thesis advisor was not one of that very few. So our data came out in hard copy on long strips of paper chart, like in this picture. I got a hundred feet of that chart paper every day. I took four days to scan the sky. So there's 400 foot of chart paper per sky scan and I'm running it for six months. So I end up with about three miles or five kilometers of this chart paper. Analyzing it was formidable. I could not keep up with the analysis and, and run the telescope as well. Now, you'd think with that amount of paper going past, you really would have very little memory of what was on the charts. And that's what I believed. So I thought this is a great experiment. Each day's data I'm seeing as fresh with no memory. This is brilliant. But actually there was a little bit of the chart that didn't make sense to me. Remember I was suffering imposter syndrome and I was being very, very thorough so that when they threw me out, I not have a guilty conscience. And I had survived two years up till then. There was a little bit that I couldn't make sense of. I could recognize the scintillating quasars and I could recognize artificial interference. There was a lot of that because such a large radio telescope is very sensitive. In those days, cars were badly suppressed. So we picked up every passing automobile. Um, sparking thermostats, arc welders, anything that generated radio waves, my radio telescope would pick up. And you'd typically get little bursts of interference, like as marked in this chart. But just occasionally, there was about half a centimeter of signal that didn't look like a scintillating quasar and didn't look like interference. Uh, it took up about 10 parts in a million of the chart paper, but physicists' brains are quite well trained and this lodged at the back of my mind. And after I'd come across it a few times, my brain said, you've seen something like this before, haven't you? You've seen it from this bit of sky before, haven't you? And then it's easy because I file the rolls of paper by which strip of the sky, which latitude on the sky, which declination it is. I stored them in shoe boxes. So you go get the shoe box that covers that particular strip of sky, get out all the previous charts. The grad students were all in an attic. So there was a lot of floor space. So you spread out these charts on the floor, line them up so that all the radio sources are lined up and you say, yeah, this is the occasion just now that I've seen it. It wasn't there the last time I looked. It wasn't there the time before that. It might have been there before that, but it's a bit marginal. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, it's there. I marked it then with a question mark. No, no. Yeah. And when it's there, it's always coming from the same bit of sky. It's got the same right ascension and declination coordinates. It's often not there, but when it's there, it's from the same spot. I didn't know what this was, except that it's moving around with the stars. It comes back every 23 hours, 56 minutes. You know, the stars don't work on a 24 hour day. That's why you see different constellations in the winter night sky and the summer night sky. The stars get four minutes earlier a day. And this thing, whatever it was, was getting four minutes earlier a day, even though it wasn't visible every day. So just to talk you through the difference between the two signals that we can see in this diagram, the one nearer the center labeled interference, the spikes go up and down, and you can see a bit of space between the spikes. It's lowish frequency. Whereas the one on the left, the spikes go mainly up. There's a little bit of overshoot downwards, maybe, but they go mainly up 
and at least for some of the time they're so closely packed you cannot see chart between them. When you make that kind of comparison, you're doing a Fourier analysis. You're talking about the amplitudes. The spikes go up and down, positive and negative, or the spikes go positive only. And you're talking about the frequencies. You can see paper between the spikes. That's low frequency. You cannot see paper between the spikes. That's high frequency. Well, my supervisor rightly observed that this signal only occupied about a quarter inch and whatever it was, was all jammed into that quarter inch. What we need is an enlargement. And with chart paper technology, that's easy. You run the paper faster under the pen, it all gets spread out and you've got your enlargement. Except if I leave the chart recorder running at that speed, it'll get through the roll of paper in 20 minutes. And guess who spends her life at the observatory, day and night, putting a fresh roll of paper in every 20 minutes? Not a good idea. Next bright idea, the grad student goes out just before this bit of sky is due to be observed switches to the high speed recording, waits till that bit of sky has passed through the telescope and is gone and switches back to the normal slower speed. And I did that for a month and I made high speed recordings of receiver noise. The signal, whatever it was, had gone away. My thesis advisor was furious. It's the grad student's fault. It always is the grad student's fault. It's been and gone and done it and you've missed it. I continued doing this diligently until one day I decided to stuff this. I'm skipping a day. There's a lecture I want to go to in the centre of town. I skipped it. Next day went out to the observatory and found the signal had reappeared. The one and only day I'd skipped. I didn't dare tell anybody. I stayed on. I got the recorder going fast again and hoped it would behave. And what came in was this signal. Ignore the labeling, which is added later. The bottom trace is one second time pips. Uh, there was a station that very kindly broadcast one second time pips, so we recorded those. And the upper signal is, upper trace is the signal that came in. And starting on the left, there's maybe a hint of some pulses. And then there's three you can see very clearly, one missing, but back on phase, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, several missing, and at the end, a few more little ones back on phase. This thing keeps beat, whatever it is. Sometimes the signals aren't strong enough to see, sometimes they're strong. I phoned my thesis advisor, who was quite convinced his grad student was mad, well, that settles it. It's man-made interference, was his verdict. But he was interested enough to come out to the observatory the next day at the appropriate time and watched as I switched to the high-speed recording. And fortunately for me, it performed again. So having been absent for a month, it then performed two days in a row. And my supervisor was more convinced, having seen it for himself, and we quickly established that the pulse period was the same as the day before. The pulses are quite steep, which implies the object small, but if it keeps pulsing at the same rate, it's got big energy reserves, so it must be big. And we struggled with this for quite a while. We got a colleague who had another radio telescope and receiver on site, and worked at the same frequency because my thesis advisor was quite sure I'd wired the telescope up wrong and that's what the problem was but this other telescope and its receiver also managed to pick up the pulsing signal so at least it wasn't that our telescope was wired up wrong still didn't still didn't tell us what it was but never mind I continued keeping observations of this um, 
there were lots of things we were wondering about. Was it a satellite in a funny orbit? Would we see it moving? Uh, my thesis advisor, um, his writing, LGM1, Little Green Men, one. Detectives, that's clearly added afterwards. You don't number the first one, number one. It's only when you got more than one, you go back and call the first one, number one. But LGM, they became known as, although we did not seriously believe we were picking up signals from little green men, but we had to prove otherwise. I continued the routine observations. I continued the observations of that particular object with high speed recording. And we realized very quickly that this source kept sidereal time. It keeps a 23 hour, 56 minute day, not a 24 hour day. So it's not Joe Dokes driving down the road in a badly suppressed car. And even if it was, Joe Doke was getting off work four minutes earlier a day, 28 minutes a week. And this has been going on for several months. It's moving around with the stars. Could it be faulty equipment? No, because a colleague and his grad student had seen it with their telescope, their recorder. We also were struggling with the fact that it must be small because the pulses were quite short and steep, but it must be big because the pulse period remained remarkably constant. So it's got big energy reserves. So it's big and small, yippee. Then a colleague managed to get a dispersion measurement. Electrons in space allow higher frequencies to travel faster than lower frequencies. So he took two of my receivers, he tuned one up a bit and tuned one down a bit and managed after many, many attempts to see that the signal, the pulses arrived first in the higher frequency and later in the lower frequency. And by measuring the time delay and guessing at the number of electrons in interstellar space, he estimated a distance of 200 light years. So it's within our galaxy, but way beyond the solar system. My supervisor, Tony, meanwhile, was keen that I continued making these high speed recordings because he wanted to look for Doppler shifts in the pulse period. If this really was little green men, they probably lived on a planet that orbited their sun. And as their planet orbited, it would, we would see Doppler shifts. So I kept making these observations week after week and we found a Doppler shift, but it was due to the motion of the earth around the sun because motion of the observer also gives a Doppler shift. So we'd proved that the sun went, the earth went round the sun, but otherwise weren't making a lot of progress. Meanwhile, I was continuing, continuing to analyze the data and we just reached a crunch point when we thought, how are we going to publish this result when we only have one? Nobody will believe us. They'll think we are crazy. We'll destroy the lab's reputation. And that night, I suspected I'd found a second and went out to the observatory at two o'clock in the morning and got the fast recorder going and in came another bleep, 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 this time at one and a quarter seconds, whereas the first one was one and a third seconds. So we have another object behaving in a very similar but not identical way in a different part of the sky. I went home for Christmas. Tony kept the survey running, which meant he put fresh paper and fresh ink in the pen recorders and he piled the charts on my desk for analysis. I came back after the holiday, busy scanning another bit of the sky and suddenly thought, oh, that looks interesting. Could it be another? I'll check in a minute. I've only about two meters of chart paper more to analyze. I'll do that and then I'll go back and check. Move on about one meter. Oi, that looks interesting. Two of them 
a meter apart on the same piece of chart. What's going on? At that point, Tony, my supervisor, arrived. And I said, look, Tony, look, 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 look. And he said, huh, how many more have you missed? Go back through all your old records. I had several miles of paper chart by this stage. I went back through all the old records. We knew about two, we confirmed the third and the fourth, and I didn't find any more. And in fact, that radio telescope only found one more in total. It wasn't the best frequency for studying these objects. So now we could publish the first one. We knew that we had more and the paper announcing the second, third and fourth would follow quite soon afterwards. The name Pulsar was created by the science correspondent of a rather conservative established British paper. He suggested the name Pulsar. And what we now understand the Pulsars to be are very compact, very dense objects, highly magnetized with the magnetic field offset from the spin axis. And somehow, a lot of hand waving here still, a radio beam comes out from the conical field line configuration over the poles. Uh, it sw swings around the sky as the star spins. It's a bit like a lighthouse swinging a beam around the sky. And if the pulsar beam shines in your face, you see a radio pulse. If it doesn't, you don't. So what has this led to? Well, these are objects with very strong gravitational fields, so we're dabbling in large gravity. It's ultimately led to the detection of gravitational waves. It's made black holes seem more plausible. It's involved some very solid state physics. It's involved work understanding radio emission from high electric and high magnetic fields with relativistic physics thrown in and it's led to the discovery of fast radio bursts. I'm not going to talk about all of those, but I'm going to spend a few minutes just introducing some of those themes. Apparently it was Galileo who first asked if objects of different material, if they were dropped from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, would fall at the same rate and hit the ground together. It's rumored that he did this test it's not terribly accurate if done on the earth because there's air resistance. So you need to watch the size and shape of the objects as well. But the astronauts, when they went to the moon, repeated this experiment. The first version of it, the video was barely visible. This is a repeat um, by Apollo 15, Dave Scott. And you can see a hammer and a feather about knee height and they are both falling at the same rate. Uh, the question's also been studied with solar system bodies, and we know that solar system bodies fall at the same rate to one part in 10 to the power 14. However, we now have a pulsar in a triple system, and we can use it to test rather more accurately uh, if objects of different composition fall at the same rate. The outer pair of objects is a pulsar and a white dwarf star, white dwarf star. These are basically made of different composition and they are orbiting another white dwarf star, which you can see in the center of the ellipse. Now, if the pulsar material and the white dwarf material respond differently to the gravity of the central white dwarf, then characteristics of that outer binary orbit will change. And you can monitor the characteristics of that orbit by studying the pulsar pulse rate and the Doppler shifts on it. It's a pretty tricky experiment to do. Um, there's been a lot of work on it. I think the conclusion now is that they fall at the same rate there is not any difference between the way the white dwarf star and the pulsar respond to gravity to within the errors of me measurement. 
but I'm not quite sure what those errors are at the moment. Um, I haven't yet found a publication either, but that's what I believe has happened. Gravitational radiation is something that physicists have talked about for quite a while. Ripples in space-time. And there was a hint that gravitate, well, more than a hint, that gravitational radiation would exist way back in 1974, when Hulse and Taylor found the first pulsar in a binary system. This one was a pulsar twinned with another neutron star, but the other neutron star is not pulsing, it's quiet. And they were able to study the orbit of this binary pair by observing the pulse period of the pulsar. And this lovely graph shows the data they obtained, and it's a very, very nice curve. It now actually goes more up to 2020, but that's 35 years of data. You can see the data points, the line is not the best fit line. The line is Einstein's prediction, the general relativity prediction. And it's a beautiful fit and continues to be a beautiful fit. And it shows that there must be gravitational radiation from that binary system to cause that change in the orbit. But that was indirect detection of gravitational radiation. You perhaps know that uh, a few years back um, in the USA, the LIGO detectors, laser interferometers, based on the Michelson interferometer, detected the first gravitational wave signal. Uh, I mentioned Ron Drever. I was an undergraduate in Glasgow. He was my tutor in the final year, and it was his pioneering work using Michelson interferometers that led to the LIGO detectors. He moved into gravitational radiation quite early on. I knew he was brilliant and I made a mental note to follow any field that Ron Drever worked in because it would be exciting and important. So I'd been watching the development of gravitational wave detectors for years. I wasn't sure I'd be around to see the first detection, but delighted that I was. And it was technically a very difficult measurement. They had to measure a movement of about four by 10 to the 18 meters. And since then they found many, many more sources. So that whole new spectrum is really opening up. Whoops. Um, this was their first detection, absolutely classic. It wasn't actually the in spiral of two neutron stars, which we thought it would be. It turns out that there are black holes of 20, 30, 40 times the mass of sun. And it was a binary pair of such black holes in spiraling and merging that gave this first gravitational wave detection. I kept waiting for them to detect neutron stars spiraling into each other and they did ultimately, but it wasn't till August 2017. And it turned out to be quite an important detection for other reasons as well. They managed to get an optical identification for the source. You can see in the left hand frame here, an object near the edge of a galaxy being pointed out. It was only temporarily bright three or four days later, it had disappeared virtually totally. The gamma ray burst came within two seconds of the gravitational wave merger. Fast radio bursts. You will all be aware that things can disperse white light and turn it into its spectrum. You can similarly, but not so colorfully, disperse a radio wave. This was first noticed when people were studying radio signals made by the Earth's magnetosphere. Um, this audio thing doesn't always play at the point I want it to, but let's just say if it will play. So I hope you heard a whistle. That's what it would be graphed as. 
This particular whistle is caused by a lightning stroke on the far side of the Earth. That generates a radio wave which travels around following the magnetic field lines and comes down to your receiver. The other two lines in this diagram are locally generated. Where's my cursor? Lost the cursor. Okay. Um, the other two lines are locally generated. They've come zero distance. There's no dispersion. All the frequencies arrive at the same time. Pulsar astronomers regularly look for this curved line to show that the pulses have come from some distance. So <coughs> in the top image, you see two different pulses. And below them, you see this lovely plot of frequency against time. And the curved line shows it's dispersed. It's not local. Once when radio astronomers were doing this, they found this lovely spike and this fantastically beautiful curved line showing it's not local. But it's not local with a vengeance. When you work out how many electrons you need to get that very slow dispersion, you find there aren't enough electrons in the galaxy in that direction. To explain this dispersion, you have to go way, way, way beyond the galaxy. A very long way, because once you reach the edge of the galaxy, the electron density drops hugely. So these things are at cosmic distances. For a long time, the astronomers didn't know what to do with this result. They thought nobody will believe us. Ultimately, they got it published and people said, mm, not sure I believe it. And then they started finding more. They are all highly dispersed. They come from where there's been no previous signal in radio of any sort. A few repeat, but most don't repeat. So there's nothing in that bit of sky. No optical, no infrared, no X-ray. And then we got better at the game and they managed to get positions for a few of them. And the optical astronomers said, yeah, there's a massive galaxy there. It's somewhere near the edge of a massive galaxy. That's not terribly useful information. There's a lot of stuff in a massive galaxy. They've now seen over 3,000 of them. Where they've got a galaxy, a host galaxy, they can see there are quite large redshifts. A handful are seen to repeat, and we don't know what they are. One observatory had trouble with a microwave oven. If you stop a microwave oven by opening the door, it doesn't stop immediately. There is a short burst of microwaves which will hit you in the chest. So I suggest you stop your microwave by using the stop button. We're still not sure what these are. They are the current big mystery, hugely intriguing, and with still really rather limited information. My final point is to say that the neutron stars with their very high density made black holes somehow seem more plausible. Black holes had been around from nearly as long as pulsars. The X-ray astronomers studying the object Cygnus X1 felt that the companion star really had to be a black hole. And they got more and more examples of that in due course. I'm going to finish, if I can get this to run, with an animation of a true, a correct, sorry, an observation of stars in the center of our galaxy. Each of that bluey, yellowy, purple spots is a star. Uh, and you know from Kepler's laws, well, from Newton's laws, that objects go in straight lines, unless otherwise disturbed. These stars should go in straight lines, but there's barely a straight line in sight. All the orbits are curved. And they're curved around an object at one of the foci of their ellipse. And the object is where this star shape is shown. There. And turns out that there is a black hole of a mass about 4 million times the mass of the sun 
at the center of our black hole, of our galaxy, and the nearby stars are forced to do elliptical orbits around it. And that was the topic of the Nobel Prize last year. And I will leave that animation running and say I'm stopping there. Thank you very much for your interest and your attention. And I'm sorry the 40 minutes overran a bit. You are no problem. We are so glad. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to ask everybody to uh, put their questions into the chat or just unmute and ask Professor Belbrunel the question that they want. And uh, David Carroll has his hand up, so he can Hi. go first. And if, you, if you're a visitor today, go ahead and put that in the chat too, because I know some people are visiting from UNC Chapel Hill. So go ahead and just alert us to your presence because we want to welcome you. So go ahead, we David. Also, we also have visitors here from, um, uh, from a company that we're doing some research with, and they're up here at the Nanotech Center. Uh, I want to, first of all, I want to thank you so much for sharing your time with you, uh, with us. Uh, you are, uh, for, for me, you were a huge inspiration uh, when I was a graduate student and uh, still are. So thank you so much for, for being here with us. I did want to ask you a little bit about um, the recent paper that came out uh, looking at the, uh, uh, the, uh, the gravitational wave background. Uh, this is the gravitational wave leftovers of the Big Bang. Uh, mm -hmm. That, of course, done with a uh, with a time uh, timing array of uh, pulsars. Uh, any any thoughts to share there? I I would be cautious about accepting that result for the time being. Mm -hmm. I would say, um, I'm sure they will be able to do it in time. Um, yeah, I think I think I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank the, you. Yeah, the, the idea is great. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure they've got the quality of data they need. Excellent. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Um, we have a question from Eric Carlson who you met earlier today. Um, I don't know if you can see it there in the chat. It might just be easier for you to read it. If not, it's about how you measured the Doppler shift way back uh, when you first discovered that. Yeah, so go ahead. It was a Doppler shift on the period, the spacing between the pulses. Um, yeah, you're right. We were working with a fairly narrow, I think, one or two megahertz bandwidth. So it wasn't a frequency shift in that sense, but on the spacing of the pulses. Thank you Thanks. for answering that question. Any other questions? We've, we've got some more time here. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, but, you know, you built this rather large I would, by my standards anyway, radio telescope. I mean, was that the thing that everyone was doing back then, making them that large, or was was your sort of temporarily the largest in the world? Or um, hadn't thought of that. Might have been the largest in the world, but of course we're working at quite a low frequency, so it's a wavelength of three point seven meters. So I think you have to somehow factor in the, the wavelength when you're considering the size. It was 2048 dipoles. Thank you for answering that. I, I was kind of curious about that too. Other questions? Um, you can either put them in the chat or just unmute yourself. Well, uh, may I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Veronica. Uh, thank you for this uh, wonderful lecture, and I have a question, maybe it's a bit sensitive question, but uh, I think you, you are mentioned uh, quite often as uh, an example of a person left out of a Nobel Prize, and uh, um, I'm curious what you think about that. By the way, Veronica, thanks for asking. I think we were all wanting to ask that question. <laughs> Go ahead, Jocelyn. And she's put it beautifully too, thank you, <laughs> yes. Um, I do remember the day of the announcement of the Nobel Prize. I was at that stage working in X-ray astronomy and our satellite had launched at eight o'clock that morning. And by about 11 o'clock, we'd all drifted back to our offices to work because clearly the launch was successful and fine. And then on the news at noon was the Nobel Prize. And a colleague came rushing into my office shouting, have you heard the news? Have you heard the news? And I thought, oh, the satellites failed. <laughs> it wasn't, it was the Nobel Prize. 
Uh, actually, I was pleased. Um, I'm a bit of a strategist. And I knew instantly that this was probably the first time that the Nobel Physics Prize had gone to anything astronomical. There is no astronomy Nobel Prize. And until the Physics Prize Committee clearly felt they'd plenty of physicists to award it to, but this created a precedent. And I knew that other astrophysicists would walk through that door afterwards. And so I was pleased. And in fact, since then, probably 20 astrophysicists have had the Nobel Physics Nobel Prize. Um, I've also discovered that you can do very well out of not getting a Nobel Prize. If you get a Nobel Prize, there's a fantastic party and, and so on. And uh, when Joe Taylor, Joe Taylor and Russell Hulse got the Nobel Prize for the binary pulsar, they invited me along as their guest to Stockholm. And that was huge fun. For a prize winner, it's really hard work, but for a guest, it's fun. Um, and I knew that other astrophysicists would get it. And I have also discovered that by not getting a Nobel Prize, you get everything else that moves. So each year, typically, there's some sort of award and there's a party. Whereas if you win a Nobel Prize, people say, oh, we can't match that. We better find somebody else to give this prize to. And you don't get anything else. So I think I've had the best of both worlds. <laughs> okay, thank you. Never, nevertheless, there are a lot of us who, who uh, know the truth, let's just say. I, we, <laughs> feel that, uh, we feel that you were certainly the, the driver. Thank you. And following on that point, uh, in our interview, you mentioned how um, differently people treated you and your advisor when they were interviewing you after the discovery of the pulsar, um, and how some of the you know the kind of questions that they would ask you as a woman and him as a, uh, a man uh, inspired you to do things for women in STEM. So I don't know if you want to just briefly share with some of us uh, about those things, just so we are aware of what you're doing over in Europe. Yes, right. Um, partly from the experience of being interviewed by journalists following the discovery, where they would ask me questions like, what were my bust, waist and hip measurements, please? And the photographer saying, could I undo some more buttons, please, for the photograph? Um, I began noticing the way women were treated. There weren't many women who worked at that point. Um, the ultimate goal in a woman's life apparently was to get married and be a stay at home wife and mother, um, which wasn't my career plan incidentally, but that was apparently what women were meant to do. Um, so I was working and I became quite aware that the academic, the university system wasn't set up for women. For example, when I became pregnant, I went to the chair of department and said, what maternity leave am I entitled to? And he said, maternity leave? Never heard of it. And he was right. The university did not have maternity leave. And I, I ended up working part time for quite a lot of my career because there was a child to be looked after. Uh, and generally became more and more aware that the women that there were in academia were not encouraged and were often subtly discouraged. And later in life, I joined a group of other senior women scientists wondering, what can we do to make life better for women in science in universities? And we came up with an award scheme, which we called Athena Swan. Um, as one of us observed, the, the heads of universities, what you'd call presidents, were competitive guys, and they were all men at that stage. If we created a competition for the most woman-friendly university, they'd compete. We were broke, we could only afford a glass rose bowl but we announced this competition and she was right, they competed. And we awarded the glass rose bowl. And the next year 
several more universities competed and so on, and it gradually grew. Now, this is where you all need to start listening because it's coming to roost near you. We created a scheme called the Athena Swan Scheme, an award scheme for universities, which asked them to look at their data on women in the university, women in science or in the arts faculties, men in the arts faculties, and to lay out what schemes they had to try and improve the gender balance. And this got adopted by the funding bodies and has become a really big thing, has been exported to Ireland, to the arts and humanities subjects in Britain, um, to Australia, to Canada, and it's coming in in the USA under the theme, under the name of Sea Change, S-E-A Change. It's been run out of the treble A-S. I don't know if you've got to hear of it yet, but it's rather like our Athena Swan scheme. And scientists, of course, respect data. So when you see how many or how few women you have, and when you see whether they progress as well as the men or not as well as the men, you can start thinking what your data is telling you. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to end on that note. We can all look forward to seeing uh, the Sea Change program coming to the United States. And um, I'm a big fan of ranking universities along different lines because I do think it promotes uh, uh, some good positive things that have happened, such as uh, with the Athena program that you mentioned. So let's thank our speaker one more time for visiting us with, with us this past hour. Thank you. Yes, and anyone who um, wishes to stay along, you can stay along, but I am going to stop recording here.